Okay, we're back. We're live for the three o'clock block on a given Wednesday afternoon. I'm Jay Fidel, and with me, joining me from Mexico, uh, is uh, Emily Medina. She's a research fellow at EPRINC, the Energy Policy Research Foundation, operating out of Washington. Uh, so welcome to the show, Emily. So nice to have you here with us. Hi, Jay. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. So a very important topic today, very important topic, a couple, three days ago, over the weekend, I guess, uh, we had an attack of drones on the Aramco, uh, the Saudi Aramco uh, oil facilities in Saudi Arabia. A uh, very profound attack in the sense that uh, the, the, there's a lot of oil that goes worldwide from that facility. And it did, did some damage. There are a number of drones. They did some damage. And uh, we've heard news about, uh, you know, whether this is going to affect uh, oil supply and market or not. Um, the administration has made statements about it, you know, suggesting it's no big deal. But then uh, these days, one, one has to take that with a grain of salt. Uh, so we're really not sure, Emily, what, you know, what has happened in terms of uh, the uh, oil uh, supply for the world and, and prices for the world. And we thought we'd ask you to uh, let us know. So uh, can you give us a handle on what has happened in terms of oil supply um, and what we can expect? Sure. Um, so, like you said, you know, there's, there were some recent attacks on a major oil production facility in Saudi Arabia on Saturday. And, and just recently on Monday, we're already seeing um, an increase in prices up by 20%. So, we can see that the effect has been immediate on gasoline prices worldwide. Um, so, um, just to um, provide a little bit of context of what happened. Mm -hmm. So, um, th this facility in, in Saudi Arabia produces, I mean, all of Saudi Arabia has a production of 12 million barrels of oil per day. Mm -hmm. This is a huge production, one of the largest in the world. Mm -hmm. So, the recent attack represented um, a direct um, reduction in that production in, by half. So instead of having um, the production capacity of Saudi Arabia at around 12 million barrels of oil per day, we're having half of that. So we're just having 6 million barrels of oil per day. Mm -hmm. So this is a huge decline. On, on, on one of the biggest um, producers in the world. And mm -hmm. this has direct consequences, like I said, in, in gasoline prices worldwide. So it even affects places like the U.S., Mexico, North America. And, and, and we can see um, this uh, already impacting gasoline prices. You know, Emily, so, it, it strikes me that we, we need to examine what market is served um, by these facilities in Aramco, uh, Saudi Arabia. Um, are, they, are they serving a particular market that will be more affected uh, than other markets? Well, um, so there's some um, main alleys that Saudi Arabia has. And the main, um, is, so Saudi Arabia has strict export market for its product. One of those export markets is the USA. Mm -hmm. So United States um, is integrated to Saudi Arabia in that way that um, right now, although the US is close to being a uh, net oil and exporter, it still um, relies on, on imports of crude oil from places like Saudi Arabia mm -hmm. and Mexico as well, mm -hmm. and as well as, you know, other countries. Mm -hmm. um, so what happens then is that although the U.S., you know, claims that it's um, being energy independent and reaching energy dominance, although, you know, we see a lot of this um, Rhetoric. I mean, it, it's still very hard for the U.S. to be um, solely independent, mm -hmm. and this is because the nature of the of oil pricing is based on a global market. Mm -hmm. So, 
we so the U.S. is still um, very much uh, vulnerable to foreign shocks. Well, well, you know, I remember there was something in the newspaper from, I guess, the White House uh, saying, don't worry about a thing. Uh, we have all these oil reserves um, and we'll just uh, we'll we'll, you know, uh, deploy some of those reserves into the system. And this uh, thing in Aramco won't have any effect. What, what are the do you know what the extent of those reserves are? Is, is that a true statement? Will we be will be able to insulate ourselves from the effect of the attack by um, bringing oil reserves uh, into the market? Yeah, so that's a good question. And I mean, there's a lot of components to just integrate to understand what's happening in terms of, of those reserves. So, um, so the total uh, supply uh, from those reserves is 640 and 40 million barrels of oil per day. So that's the total number of reserves that we have in case of any emergency. Uh -huh. And what happens with that is that we need to um, be careful on how we manage those reserves. And right now, I mean, the tactic has been to be cautious on, on withdrawing um, supplies from, from those reserves and to just, you know, um, try to mitigate the the direct um, shock um, by, you know, uh, reducing our our consumption and and managing the demand as best as we can in a controlled way. So instead of you know immediately going and with and, and, and taking um, oil from the reserves, we need to first um, in, to try to handle this issue as best possible in a best in a, you know as best as we can. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, um, well, you, you know, when you think about utilities um, and the generation of electrical power and so forth, um, and you think about um, either, uh, you know, internal problems, maybe fires or some damage from weather, extreme weather, for example, um, or if it just goes online because it, it failed for some reason, um, at least in Hawaii, we don't we don't have a, a big storehouse of extra parts. We don't have a you know necessarily a backup generator available, um, and we you know we either have to rely on the you know sophisticated switching equipment in the grid, or we have to send away and try to fly in or you know bring in at the most expeditious manner um, you know replacement parts and and um, whatever the equipment that was damaged uh, is, we have, to, we have to find it in the world and bring it in. So I was thinking, as soon as I heard about this Aramco thing, that these drones, A, they did damage by exploding in and around the oil equipment in Aramco, and B, they, they caused a fire, which is going to melt the steel, or whatever the material is, in, in the facility, and somebody's going to have to fix that up before you can Increase back from what was it, six million barrels a day to twelve, and and uh, it's not like Saudi Arabia has a big industrial complex where they can make a call and uh, and have this thing fixed overnight. That's not the case. They're going to have to you know uh, order it, um, maybe have it fabricated in Europe. They're going to have to ship it over. They're going to have to install it, maybe redesign the system to accept the new part. It sounds like a project, uh, and I would assume that in in the situation I described in the utility company or in the situation I described in the Ramco, this is not overnight. This is not, you know, days or weeks. It's probably months at best. Um, so getting back from 6 million to 12 million barrels is something we're going to have to wait on. But my, my first question then is, is that true, what I imagine? And the second is, what happens while we're waiting? Yeah, that's a good question. So yeah, that's, that's exactly right. I mean, this thing. I mean, it's it's going to take a lot more the, to to get fixed. So there's some projections that um, that the production will normalize by the end of October or by early November. That to me seems um, very optimistic. And there was a recent announcement by the newly nominated uh, energy minister in Saudi Arabia 
who said that um, that they were going to start bringing production as quickly as possible. And this was, I mean, mainly to, I would say, to calm the market and to not have, you know, a drastic, um, <laughs> to have, you know, a panic attack throughout the, mm-hmm. the you know, globally, globally and, and have the, you know, the economy affected by it. So uh, on that note, like you said, you know, it's going to take months for production to normalize. And on the meantime, uh, what countries can do, I mean, the countries with the, that are more equipped in, in their infrastructure in terms of storage uh-huh. and pipeline and integration with other countries uh-huh. are going to be the most energy secure out of this whole, uh, you know, uh, like, like, you can say it's a, it's a, a conflict in terms of, of a, a, a disruption in uh-huh. global oil uh, <laughs> yeah. supply. So and I think that's a, a very important thing uh, as we talk about energy security globally so, and what it means. Because you hear some countries like Mexico saying that they want to become energy self-sufficient and, and to reduce their imports to become more energy secure. And we need to understand the global context of, of energy. And so it, it, it's not necessarily that those who are secluded from other uh, countries and their energy supply are going to be the most energy secure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, you know, let's, let's take a walk down that path. Um, what I, what I found interesting from a technological point of view is uh, that these drones uh, from wherever they came, whether they came from Yemen or Iran or, any, or Iraq, whatever they, wherever they came from, and we can make our own guess. I don't, I don't think we know for sure just yet. Um, these drones are a new kind of weapon. You know, I remember uh, two weeks ago, uh, we learned that um, the Israelis were very concerned about drones that were being assembled in western Syria, um, and, and they went and bombed them. And the reason was that they found that these drones were not the kind of drones that merely shoot things. These drones were bombs. They were explosives. And so the, uh, the, you know, the, the, uh, the person who flies the drone, you know, the, instruct, the instruction giver of the drone, can, take, can direct the drone into a target and then the drone acts as a bomb. I suspect that what happened here is those kinds of drones were used. They have a maximum payload, much more than the kind that shoots, you know, shoots at things. And when they land, they really blow up good. Um, so this is a whole new world. The Israelis saw it correctly, I think, in Western Syria. That's why they were concerned enough to go bomb, bomb the facility where they were being assembled. Um, and, and in this case, uh, I think it should give us some pause because as you said, energy security is very important. It's a strategic activity uh, in the U.S., uh, in Mexico, uh, and all through the Middle East, uh, in parts of Asia. Um, and so we now are in a new world, are we not? Where these drones, which can be very anonymous, they've sent relatively anonymous, you know, uh, 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 you know, a place, a place from an anonymous place. These drones uh, can do incredible damage. You know, small drones that are bombs can do incredible damage to a targeted facility where the technology will take the drone exactly where it needs to go and destroy energy, uh, you know, uh, oil, um, oil facilities uh, in a way that uh, the damage is maximum. Uh, thus, uh, you know, undermining energy security in that location. And I mean, if we weren't sure that this kind of thing could happen yeah, before, yeah. And I mean, yeah. And it's very interesting that this energy attack um, affects the whole world. So, and and this is because it's directly affecting one of the largest oil facilities in the world. If it was a utility system, a grid, a power grid, we wouldn't have the same global impact as we're having today. So as we move forward and as, you know, um, our systems become more digitalized, 
Uh, we're going to see other types of risk emerging, such as um, cybersecurity attacks in our power system that can likely affect a country or a couple of, of, of countries that are in, in the close proximity and fed by the same energy infrastructure. But it's going to be um, a different type of, of energy security threat that um, does not have as much of a global reper repercussion. Yeah, so if you were de designing an, an energy facility, an oil, an oil facility um, such as Aramco Saudi, uh, right now, today, a brand new one, you would design it differently. You would design it to protect it against this kind of attack, which has just emerged. Um, and you would take steps to uh, create security against this, this you know, new and uh, uh, threatening uh, technology. Um, and I, I might note that I don't think anybody's come up with an, an actual solution for the existing facilities. Um, these, these drones can get through whatever defenses there are and penetrate them with, with impunity. Uh, they can be directed at a critical part of the um, oil infrastructure and uh, do their damage with, you know, with very little chance of being stopped. Somebody, maybe the U.S., has got to figure out how to stop them. Um, otherwise, uh, there will be no energy security on the planet. Uh, that uh, somebody, uh, some you know, mischievous uh, actor, a state actor included, uh, could could affect oil security anywhere, anytime, using this kind of technology. Am I right? Yes, that's totally and completely correct. Um, so, and it's so just a sample of how. And the U.S. is affected right now by the Saudi Arabia uh, attack is that um, if we look at California on the West Coast, um, there's not the infrastructure that's necessary to move oil, domestic oil in the U.S. to that demand center. And it currently receives its, uh, its, its crude oil supply from Saudi Arabia uh -huh. and to produce the, the state's gasoline. Uh -huh. So that's a direct impact on, on the U.S. Uh -huh. the economy and, and what have you. Well, well let me uh, visit with you on one thing you said earlier, Emily, which caught my attention, and that is, uh, you know, I asked you, um, you know, whether, whether there was a specific market or markets affected being served by Aramco Saudi Arabia. and you said, well, the U.S. was one of the big markets there and so forth that would affect the U.S. Even though we have our own supply, um, we still need Aramco supply. And maybe that's why this administration and previous In administration... Like California. Right. Um, and maybe that's why the U.S. and previous administrations have been so determined to maintain, um, you know, relations, positive relations uh, with Saudi Arabia, even though Saudi Arabia has been guilty of um, very offensive acts like uh, the bombing of Yemen and like the uh, assassination of Khashoggi, the Washington Post reporter. Um, but you know, yeah, it's still in our geopolitical interest, yeah. especially when it comes to energy. Yes, right. It's a it's a it's a balance, uh, and maybe you can make a wrong decision there in the in the morality of it. But let me let me pursue one thing. You know, it's, so. So, okay, so the oil is dedicated to certain markets, but, but the fact is that uh, when you have a failure of supply, reduction of supply in one market, uh, that affects other markets, so that we live in a global world, right? Yes. And any market affects all markets. Tell me how that works. Yes, I mean, what better example to explain this than the U.S.-Mexico energy relations. So right now, like we said, you know, the U.S. is affected because um, there has been a, a cut in, in Saudi Arabia's um, oil production. And so that, that not only affects the U.S., it also um, repercutes and affects Mexico. So Mexico right now imports 60% of its gasoline, and that gasoline is mainly coming from the U.S. And as the U.S. struggles to satisfy its own domestic demand, it 
is going to have repercussions on on the exports it, that it sends to Mexico and gasoline. Mm -hmm. So, so by Mexico being um, you know integrated to to the U.S., it is it has several benefits, but it also has you know downsides and. A way that Mexico can mitigate that downside is by in investing in its energy infrastructure and building out storage. Mm -hmm. Because right now, in the current in, uh, the, the current situation in Mexico, is that there's only two days worth of gasoline storage in the country. Oh wow! Compared to the U.S. storage that has around I don't know 20 days. Wow! So this is a you know. A, a scarcity in our, in our energy infrastructure. Well, you've described you've described uh, the supply side of it, and indeed, I mean, if we don't, uh, you know, we don't have the same supply coming out of Saudi Arabia, and if that that has this kind of trickle down effect or tri trickle across effect across the planet, then there'll be supply problems in the supply chain everywhere because we'll all try to have to compensate for the lack of supply from Saudi Arabia. But the more Interesting question, really. Well, maybe it's equally interesting question. Is so yeah, if you have because haven't... just to give a you know the complete picture. Yeah. This has to do with the fact that the oil is priced in a global market. Right. So countries right. like Mexico, you know, with the passing on the energy reform, they took out the subsidies and our gasoline. And right now, the gasoline is being priced in a global market. So if prices go up globally, it affects our, you know, every consumer and at the at the gas station. Mm -hmm. There's no, you know, way around it. Mm -hmm. So if if we find because of the uh, the problems in the supply chain and supply uh, that there, you know, there are hiccups in various places on the supply. We can likewise uh, expect there'll be uh, an increase in the price for the lack of that supply, and that that increase will not just be in one place; it'll be in all places that are affected by. So that means globally, we'll have an increase in the price of oil, right? Yes, that's exactly right. And there's an estimate of that price increasing about fifteen percent to twenty percent. During the period between On now, not be, during the period between now and the time that the um, the uh, facility in Saudi Arabia is repaired, yeah. Exactly. So this is because uh, from one day to another, six percent of our global oil supplies came offline. So now, um, That's a huge... you you said that the U.S. had a certain reserve, twenty days, I think. And Mexico had a smaller reserve, three days and so Two. forth. Two days, sorry. Yeah. Um, and so now, um, you know, October is more than that away. Um, and what, I guess the question that comes to my mind is, uh, and, and we're not sure it's going to be done, fixed by October, um, even the end of October. It may go into November. Yeah, I mean, that's an optimistic outlook, either. Yeah. And, and of course, as you get into November, all the temperate climates are going to get colder. There'll be more of a demand for fuel, uh, for, you know, uh, fuel for, for, for heating. And so, um, you know, that creates further demand. So I guess my, my question is, um, you know, are we going off the brink here? If we don't finish it, you know, the repairs in October, we go into November and December, um, and we are you know, sort of out of oil, or we run into very short supply. What happens on the world market? What happens on the on the supply side? What happens on the pricing side? Well, I think those countries who have uh, the strongest infrastructure will be um, the winners out of this situation. And those with you know weaker infrastructure are going to to realize larger pain. In this, uh, in this, from this uh, current event. Mm -hmm. So, um, so countries like the U.S. I mean, having such a large uh, gasoline storage, uh, it puts a, a bandaid over the current situation, and yeah. can you know and help uh, withdraw. Uh, 
gradually uh, supply from those from those uh, from the strategic reserve. Mm -hmm. There'll be a scramble. And this was, you know, this is a, a measure that that's uh, undertaken by the the International Energy Administration, and this is one of the best practices globally. And that is to have a strategic um, reserve in, mm -hmm. in, you know, in the countries that are part of the mm -hmm. the, the International Energy Administration. It becomes, so, di it becomes difficult to manage that, of, doesn't it, Ellie? It becomes difficult to manage Sorry? that. It, it becomes difficult to manage that if you have a, a global demand uh, in, in, say, a, a, a market that requires more for heating oil. Um, and uh, you have a, a supply that's um, seriously limited. Um, you know, the, all the best plans of mice and men may, uh, may not solve the problem, and you may have a scramble for whatever oil there is. Am I right? The system may not work. Yes. And, and right now, luckily, and uh, Saudi Arabia is prioritizing um, exporting oil to its markets because it wants to be seen as a reliable supplier mm -hmm. of oil. Mm -hmm. And so by doing this, you know, instead of uh, using it domestically, it, it's exporting as much as it can. Mm -hmm. One other point I'd like to cover before we have to go, Emily, is this. You know, there are those that feel that this, these, this drone attack is a direct result of the, uh, of the administration's uh, ongoing argument and, um, and name-calling with uh, Iran. Um, and in fact, uh, uh, President Trump has said that he would like to, he, he is considering um, putting American troops on the ground to, um, uh, you know, to respond to the attack. I'm not sure what he'd do. Uh, and he wants, uh, he want, he wants uh, uh, let's see, Saudi Arabia to pay for it. Saudi Arabia is oil rich, I mean, or cash rich because of the oil. Um, and so, you know, what you have is um, the American, you know, the, uh, the American presence and American interest. Obviously, we, we, we want to, you know, preserve this, this pipeline, so to speak. And I, and I wonder, you know, if, if you take all of that together, everything we've been talking about here, uh, you know, what is an appropriate position for this country to take to restore the supply? and to protect the supply in the future. Uh, because whether he's right or wrong about where it came from and whether it needs to you know, do, do fisticuffs, the um, fact is that we have an interest in preserving this supply of oil. So what, what do you recommend? If, uh, if Donald Trump were on the line with us today, right now, Emily, what would you tell him? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, diplomacy is key in, in in addressing those types of issues and, and preventing them. And I think this is an issue that could have been prevented um, by having an open dialogue with Iran and, and with the European countries and trying to, to put in sanctioning measures in Iran that wouldn't uh, cause the country to go as far as this as going to to attack, you know, this Saudi Arabia and Saudi uh, Arabia facility. Thank you, Emily. So Emily Medina. You know that the is very, 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 uh, very helpful. Very helpful. Uh, thank you very much for helping us with these very difficult issues in these difficult times. Emily Medina, who is a uh, researcher for uh, EPRINC in Washington, D.C., uh, and right now she joins us from Mexico. Thank you so much, Emily. I hope to speak to you again soon. Yeah, it's my pleasure, Dee. Aloha.